Hello, I'm here today to discuss a disease called interstitial cystitis. And here today with me, I have Dr. Theocharidis to discuss the disorder with us. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, pharmacology and internal medicine here in Boston, and I've been uh, studying interstitial cystitis uh, close to 15 years. Excellent. So for those people who aren't as familiar with IC, can you give us an idea of what the disease is? It's a very confusing disorder, and I'm very sympathetic to all the sufferers, patients out there, because I'm sure they've had a very difficult time to find uh, the right physician and get the right diagnosis. Uh, typically, uh, a patient would have a lot of discomfort. Some patients call it pressure, pain, in what we call the suprapubic area or lower abdominal area, which is very confusing at times because it doesn't necessarily indicate the bladder. This is why a lot of patients and physicians consider it chronic pelvic pain. So pain is an absolute uh, symptom or requirement for the diagnosis. In addition, patients must have frequency of urination. So they might be going to the bathroom every two hours and or getting up in the middle of the night two or three times. So this combination for more than three months in the absence of a urinary tract infection qualifies someone for the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. Recently, both in Europe and now in the United States, they decided to add three more words to the title. So now they call it interstitial cystitis, painful bladder syndrome, specifically because pain is the most important symptom uh, in this disease. Excellent. Um, and how prevalent is IC? Unfortunately, the new studies, and there have been about four new epidemiological studies, have indicated that one in a hundred women actually has this disease, even though all of them may not have been diagnosed as of yet. And the worst part is, not that any patient should not be uh, as important as any other, but the disease seems to occur in the most productive years, between 20 and, let's say, 45, 50 years old. It tends to be mostly associated with women, I would say 90%, but men do get it, and the symptoms in men are very reminiscent of what we call chronic prostatitis, mm -hmm. so they too are confused as to whether they have this disease or not. Hmm. Are there symptoms that patients can ask their doctors about? Actually, yes. Uh, most of the symptoms are very reminiscent of a urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most physicians at the beginning will think it is just that. And even though the urine culture will invariably turn out to be negative, they may still put them on antibiotics for a week or two but then there is no benefit from the antibiotics. So the patients will come back saying they're getting uh, a sense of burning in urination, this pressure pain around the bladder area, which may tip the physician off that there's something else going on. Mm. And many patients have a hard time getting diagnosed with IC. Why is that? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, some of the statistics say that uh, patients go through at least five physicians and they require about four years before they can actually get a diagnosis. Uh, there's some good reasons why. Uh, one is that the symptoms, such as frequency of urination, is reminiscent of some other urologic problems, such as detrusor instability, meaning it's hyperactive uh, bladder. Uh, but there are also what we call comorbid diseases. About 60% of these patients might have other diseases, some of the symptoms of which overlap with interstitial cystitis. They may have chronic fatigue syndrome, they might have fibromyalgia, which is diffuse pains in their muscles, they may have irritable bowel syndrome, which is irritation of uh, the intestines, and very frequently, about 50% of them are misdiagnosed for endometriosis just because of the pelvic pain they feel. And once someone gets the diagnosis, what are their treatment options? Unfortunately, there is no cure for interstitial cystitis. Uh, there are some medications that are used and are helpful for some patients. The only medication that was actually approved by the FDA for this disease is called Elmiron. And uh, many patients that have mild symptoms that were newly diagnosed are prescribed Elmiron. Two other drugs that are used are used off-label, uh, meaning they're not approved for just this indication. 
One is an old antihistamine called hydroxyzine that has a lot of additional benefits. And the other is called amitriptyline, which is actually an antidepressant. In both cases, the dosage used are actually less than what we use for either allergies or for depression. And it is very important that they are taken actually slowly and increasing the dose over a few weeks because otherwise they get a lot of sedation. If someone has very severe disease, and we define severe in quotation, when uh, they are looked into the bladder, what we call cystoscopy, but not in the office setting, but after general spinal anesthesia, because during anesthesia, they fill the bladder with something like you know, water or normal uh, fluid, and they distend the bladder. In those patients that have severe disease, as they distend the bladder, you can see microhemorrhages. And in fact, that has been very important for many patients because we can take pictures and give it to them, and they can show it to their significant others, who unfortunately many times, including physicians, think it's all in their minds, and now they can show something that is actually raw in there and say, I've got a real problem. If they have such severe problems, then many urologists will introduce in the bladder certain solutions that are supposed to basically calm the inflammation in the bladder. The results say that in about 40% of the cases there might be benefit, but there's also some pain associated with the installation. Only recently there have been some efforts to try to presumably protect or recover the bladder lining that typically protects the bladder, but in many cases in this patient seems to have been destroyed to a large extent. How did you first become involved with IC? It's actually very interesting. Um, my work over the years has been actually allergies and inflammation, and clearly I'm not a urologist, I'm trained in internal medicine. However, uh, a dear friend who was uh, chief of urology uh, presented to me a biopsy of a patient with interstitial cystitis and asked me to look at some cells that he wasn't quite sure what they were. And I was absolutely astounded to recognize the cells that are involved in allergic reactions. Mm -hmm. So it almost seemed to me it was like allergy of the bladder. And ever since that time, we have tried to understand, number one, what those cells do in the bladder, number two, why the inflammation develops and to what extent these cells participate, and finally, how such inflammation breaks down the protective lining uh, of the bladder, which if it weren't there, anything bad in the urine would actually be going right through the bladder wall and back into our blood and causing all kinds of horrible problems. Mm. And how did Cystoprotec come about? So we thought, well, what is it that we have to deal with? The protective lining of the bladder is made up primarily from two components, and then we knew that there was inflammation. And since we were very interested in using natural molecules, we thought, what if we were to basically provide those two natural molecules required by the bladder lining to replenish itself and add a natural molecule that can cut down the inflammation? And all we had to do is basically put them together with one difficulty, that many of these components are very difficult to dissolve in water. So we had to find out a way of delivering them. So we mix them basically in olive seed oil, uh, which is basically the oil you get after uh, you squeeze the flesh of the olive and then you're left with the pit. As it turns out, the seeds are much richer in all the good things that uh, such plants actually have to offer. So not only we were delivering the components that correct the blood aligning, not only we were actually covering the inflammation or reducing the inflammation, but we were also delivering a little Mediterranean diet mm. in a soft shell capsule. Can you tell me a little bit more about the ingredients in Cystoprotec? How do they work? Uh, it's actually very important uh, to know not only that we are replenishing the normal protective lining of the bladder, but that we also reduce the inflammation. Because if you don't reduce the inflammation, even if you were to replenish the protective lining, you will be spinning your wheels because inflammation will destroy the bladder lining you start all over again. And what can someone expect from taking Cystoprotec? Um, there have been two studies with Cystoprotec. 
uh, one with uh, about 25 patients, the other with about 200 plus patients. And the study showed that if you were to take four soft gel capsules a day, two in the morning and two at night, in about four months, you see about 60% reduction of the symptoms. So clearly, we're not talking about treatment, we're not talking about cure. We're talking about helping the bladder, basically, on the one hand, fight the inflammation, and on the other, recover itself, so that over time, it might hopefully get back to what it should have been. Mm -hmm. So four months would be the least that I would have expected, even though some patients say that they get benefit much sooner than that. And once someone starts taking Cystoprotec, how long do you recommend that they stay on it? Since we really don't know what is the cause of this disease, uh, the recommendation is that they actually stay on it for as long as they have any symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. But what patients have told us is after about six months or so, they drop down to two capsules a day, mm -hmm. and they do fine with just that. So it's really up to the patient uh, to gauge how they would like uh, to use this at the very beginning, when someone has very severe problems, they can even take six capsules a day mm -hmm. and then slowly uh, cut down to whatever they think is absolutely needed. We do have a number of patients, though, who have done very well, and they decided to go, as we say, cold turkey and take no capsules whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And then they reported to us that within a few months, some of the symptoms started returning. Mm -hmm. um, since there's no downside to taking uh, these capsules, our recommendation is that they stay on at least one a day once they start feeling better, having started with a higher dose originally. Okay. And are there any known side effects to taking Cystoprotec? Uh, less than 1% uh, of patients, at times, at the very beginning, may feel a little gastrointestinal upset. It's like you know burping, but it's mostly because they're not used to the olive oil because 60% of the capsule is actually this olive kernel oil. Mm. Um, but they get used to it. Uh, if someone has serious heartburn from some other disease before, or they have gastrointestinal problems from before, uh, we usually recommend that they take an antacid, which they should be taking anyhow for the original problem, and that usually takes care of it. And is it safe to take with other therapies or medications? It's actually very safe. There haven't been any uh, instances where a side effect was reported. Uh, my only slight concern would be uh, if any patients are taking anti-seizure medications, uh, then they might actually just go slow and take one or two capsules rather than four capsules a day. Okay. And is this safe for children to take? Uh, in all honesty, it has not been tried in children. All the ingredients are very safe. I don't actually foresee any problem whatsoever. Uh, it's a good question because we thought that interstitial cystitis does not actually occur in children, but it does, and it occurs in adolescents as well. Mm. My only concern with young children is the capsule is fairly big, and I just want to make sure that no one actually chokes on it. Mm -hmm. But in small children, you can actually make a pinhole and squeeze the contents out and mix them up with something like applesauce yeah. and give it to, to them if uh, there is a reason to. Okay. Is there any new research or findings in the world of IC diagnosis and treatment? A lot of research has been done over the last 20 years. The results, however, have been rather disappointing. We do not have any better medications, and we still don't have a diagnosis for interstitial cystitis. Uh, newer, well-designed studies have shown that even the medications that I mentioned earlier are not as effective as they were thought to be originally. One exciting area of research has been the possible diagnosis of interstitial cystitis through some biomarker. But even that has not proven to be as effective as we thought because in research publications, uh, that biomarker seemed to be working fine, but there has not been any clinical uh, application of that and no kit that one can use to diagnose uh, interstitial cystitis. However, uh, many scientists have been working more collaboratively over the last few years, and uh, we certainly feel that uh, new findings will be forthcoming, primarily because we're changing our focus in terms of what might be the underlying problem. Originally, we thought everything was based in the bladder, because after all, this is called a bladder pain disease. Uh, but more and more colleagues and I 
tend to think that this is a more generalized problem that might have a higher expression in the bladder. And by shifting our focus somewhat, I think we might give ourselves an advantage in coming up with uh, new diagnosis and treatment. Are there any other helpful hints or suggestions you want to give to people watching? Absolutely. Uh, for patients that are newly diagnosed or have mild symptoms, uh, the recommendation would be, number one, avoid spicy foods, uh, acid kind of drinks, and uh, sometimes red wine, just like it affects migraineurs, it might affect actually uh, IC patients. Also, it is very important that they limit to the extent possible either psychological uh, or physical stress. Uh, it's been shown time and again, both in humans as well as in experiments, that stress actually worsens the inflammation uh, both in the bladder as well as in other parts of the body. Um, obviously, if someone has a bad disease, stress goes with it, mm -hmm. but there are ways of reducing stress both by taking up yoga or taking some mild anti-anxiety medication. Mm -hmm. um, the next step would be to take the Cystoprotec uh, at the same time, taking two capsules in the morning and two capsules uh, at night, maybe with a little food to reduce any possibility of gastrointestinal upset. If by four months uh, symptoms persist, then obviously one might have to actually then consider with their health provider the possibility of doing an intravesical therapy, as I had uh, mentioned uh, sort of in passing earlier, uh, without necessarily stopping all the other approaches uh, as well. Now, if some patients have other diseases at the same time, such as irritable bowel syndrome or endometriosis, then obviously those have to be worked out because then there might be specific treatment for those that might also reduce the symptoms related to the bladder at the same time. The one thing that I would like to very much stress is that if any patient has blood in the urine, mm. then they should definitely seek a urologist because blood in the urine might indicate more serious disease mm. and therefore they should be worked out for other potential diseases and not necessarily just interstitial societies. Uh, the most important thing in my mind is that they actually find a physician who is actually attentive, kind, mm. knowledgeable and then work with that particular health provider mm. because it is so difficult to find uh, such persons not only to make the right diagnosis but also follow these patients as well. And given how complicated this disease is, what would you suggest to people as the next step they should take? Um, they should definitely find information that is relevant to their problem. They can do that on two patient uh, supported websites that will be shown actually on the screen. Uh, they should find and maybe even educate their own health professionals so that they can actually then decide the right test to do and the right consult uh, to potentially uh, suggest. But very importantly, they have to have uh, a team approach. Most of the time, because we do not understand the basis of this disease, uh, the treatment tends to be multimodal, meaning different ways of approaching uh, a problem. So in some cases you will use a medication along with a dietary supplement. And because pain is such an important aspect, patients should not let themselves suffer. So if their primary physicians or urologists, uh, for whatever reason, don't pay attention to pain, uh, they should insist that they are referred actually to a pain clinic mm -hmm. because there are both oral as well as uh, medications that are given by other routes that could reduce the pain even though we might not be addressing the actual problem but the symptoms of the quality of life will be so much better that uh, they will find it uh, much easier to deal with the problem and hopefully uh, have enough perseverance for the next few years that we might hopefully come up with uh, a real treatment if not a cure. Great. Thank you very much for your time today, Dr. Theocharidis, and for talking to us about interstitial cystitis. It was my pleasure, and I thank you very much for your uh, kind question.